Greetings, this is Lansing Online News Radio. I am Bonnie Buckaroo. It is LCC Radio, WLNZ, here in Lansing, Michigan. And um, I am going soon to be joined by my co-host, Bill Castanier, who uh, was sounding a little low tonight. We need to yell a little more. It looked more. a little lower than it usually is, but I don't know why I brought it up. We get some exciting technical issues every once in a while. This is so easy tonight, though. Well, people can go to our webcast, you know, and they can actually use social media to tell us if the sound levels are okay or not. We broadcast and webcast our shows on LansingOnlineNews.com, and uh, other people should know also that they can pick up the show on radio on the LCC website on Internet Radio. But Bill, I wanted to start out tonight's discussion. You know, last week we had talked because I had been over to visit the Steve and Maria Green. They had just received news that because of the court case they have pending down in Oakland County, that there were now questions about their custody of their children being raised by Child Protective Services here in Ingham County. Um, she's a caregiver. Uh, he's a person who has severe epilepsy and has been taking medical marijuana, perfectly legal under Michigan law. But so far, they have never been able to prove that to a judge sufficiently to get the charges dismissed that from all that anybody looking at it suggests should happen at some point. Uh, but in the meanwhile, because that puts them potentially in the crosshairs of the criminal justice system, that has raised issues about child custody. And I did want to tell people that the MyMarijuanaNews.com has some video on what they went through after that. As um, It seems like every day there's always a new wrinkle in this case where one, you know, they've now had 16 different court dates, um, all kinds of legal fees, lots of complications. Even though he's not been convicted of anything, they've told him that he can no longer take his medical marijuana, so he's having horrible problems with seizures again. And it's just one of those disastrous situations. I was just writing a piece today. Colorado is about to launch its new $600 million recreational marijuana industry. And here we are still, you know, even though the law says so, arresting people in Michigan for medical marijuana. And it's, I'm sure people who are old enough to remember this think we're back in Prohibition era. It's an absurdity. Yeah. Most people recognize it as an absolute absurdity. Yeah. And doing the same thing. A lot of innocent people are caught up in a system where they shouldn't be. I went down to a town hall meeting in Grass Lake. Emphasized the word grass. Yes. Right Everybody had a good laugh on it being Grass Lake. Representative Irwin of Ann Arbor and Representative Michael Shirky of Clark Lake held a joint sort of meeting down it's a Republican there. Republican Democrat, right? A joint meeting, mm -hmm. emphasis on that as well. Um, because they are proposing through uh, House Bill 4623, uh, decriminalizing marijuana. And it was kind of interesting because I went down there, I wanted to see if there'd be a bunch of people opposing it and yelling about how we would go to hell in a handbasket. Instead, what you had were a lot of marijuana activists saying, don't decriminalize, legalize. <laughs> so I think they were surprised at the reaction they got. They, they should have expected that, though, don't you think? I would have thought, yeah. So what's, what does decriminalize mean to them? Unfortunately, the way the, uh, it appears that the bill is shaping up, it would mean that you would end up with a misdemeanor and a fine, but you would not do any jail time. So you would still end up with a criminal record. There's no relief for the people who would be growing the drug that the people would be smoking. And considering the fact that I think Colorado has taken the lead in understanding that this is, you know, if a $600 million industry, if they decide they're going to legalize in that state, it just seems to me Michigan would have been smart to build on its own medical marijuana law. I, I hate to be dismissive uh, to our two legislators who think they're probably trying to do a good thing, but they should talk to people that have criminal records with drugs. They, right. And they are just, and I'd say just with quote, misdemeanors. It ruins their lives. It does. It does. I think this is one of those wrenching social issues that's going to make, um, I think the dial's going to move pretty quickly. And I would hope that Michigan didn't fall behind the curve. We were a bit ahead of the curve with our ballot initiative, but I'm not so sure that, that's going, that we're going to stay ahead of the curve because we are seeing a backlash now. The dispensaries are gone, the oils and tinctures are gone, the courts do seem to be involved in trying to clamp down on the law. And in reality, you can see it coming, it's like a freight train. and. Um, Michigan would be smart to capitalize on it rather than drag their heels. We'll drag our heels. <laughs> you have a, every faith we will? Yeah. I see. <laughs> okay. Ever the optimist, Abel? Yeah, nothing this I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid not, but we're going to hope for the best. I don't know. At least I think they were uh, willing, the two representatives, to listen to the audience. And well, it took some guts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still not a popular issue. No. 
No, I mean, if, you know, when you talk about single issue voters, I don't think there are very many people in the state that will vote on that one issue alone. No, I had a conversation with a good friend last week who voted for um, medical marijuana who said he wouldn't vote for it again, but he didn't understand anything about it. Well, what was he unhappy about? Um, how, how, I think he was unhappy with the way it was first implemented. Oh, he didn't like the dispensaries? Yeah. Boy, a lot of people are uptight, aren't they? Yeah, and he didn't understand how it is used now in treatment very successfully for a lot of different things. The Sanjay Gupta show on CNN, I think, will change a lot of minds, and I noticed that it's in heavy rotation on CNN. Uh, people, and I think the irony is kids are going to get their hands on it first before the adults do, and that's what Chris Christie is doing. He's busy, I find this amusing, he's, you know, a Republican governor is busy legalizing cannabis for kids, but he's, <laughs> he's saying adults who have epilepsy can't have it. Right. Mm. That seems very, I think that's a sort of shocking position to take. Yeah, he, so. got, he got backed into an interesting position when the, a father confronted him right there and they're killing my daughter. Of the little three-year-old you know. girl. And the father's still not happy with what yeah. he's doing. So yeah. it's, it's going to be a big battle. It'll be interesting to see what happens. There was a representative from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition who came in to the town hall meeting and he talked about the sea change occurring in law enforcement but how hard it is going to be to change that culture overall. There's too much money in that industry, so we'll see what happens. Mm. We are joined tonight. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our upcoming show. We have two segments tonight. First, we're going to be talking with Alfred Lawrence about a screenplay he's doing. He's a member of the Center for Inquiry. That's one of the places that he and I both, I think I'm still up to date on my dues. We were just checking which organizations we remembered to send a check to this year. Talking about what it means to be in a secular society and what it means to be an avowed atheist, an open and above board atheist in the culture. Is it still as controversial as it was a few years ago? I think it's getting a little better. And then we're going to be talking with Mary Olson and she is with the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. She's in town to work with the Peace Education uh, uh, Center talking about the issue of nuclear waste. And she's joined by Linda Lewison of the Sierra Club, and she's also going to be talking with us about this issue. But I did want to start by asking you, Alfred, can you give us a little bit of information about how did you come to believe in atheism? I mean, people always ask me, did I convert to this point of view, or did it? Did you grow up in a family of secularists and humanists? No, I, I grew up in a family of uh, what we call uh, midnight mass uh, Catholics. Oh wow! We were only required to go to church, midnight mass, and then Easter. Oh, Christmas! The yeah, cr Christmas and Easter. Ah. Um, I went to a Unitarian one of those. It was very pretty. That's a <laughs> poinsettia. I just, I just remembered a very, very young age, thinking this is ridiculous. Ah. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it's just, I'm, I mean, I, I, I still put more credence in Santa Claus <laughs> than I did this. Um, and then I'm told Santa Claus isn't real. And I just put two and two together. It just, it didn't, things didn't add up. And, but I was, I was quiet about it. Um, even though I was very adamant about not going to Midnight Mass because it was just boring. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a Catholic Midnight Mass, but it's... I was a Latin major, so I knew a lot of the liturgy, but I never went to very... I went to a Catholic school. You Catholic went to a Catholic school, school, so you know all about this. Mm -hmm. Boring? Uh -huh. um, the music was okay. <laughs> I did enjoy the music. Yeah? And my my, my father, um, he, sang, he sang in the choir. Um, and uh, I believe my mother did too. At one point. Um, when did you finally decide to tell your family that you were no longer going to be part of their religion? And um, how did they respond? It really wasn't so much as me coming out and saying, I'm done. It's just, I just refused to go. Um, and it was, it was never forced on us, um, other than those two nights. Um, <laughs> the family thing. Yeah. They were doing this as a family. Um, but as we got, as I got into my teenage years, but the thing is, though, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know the word atheist back then. Right. I didn't know what it. I'd never heard it before. There was a category for right. it. Right. Yeah. Um, then I started hearing the word and what it meant, and but I wasn't ready to. I knew about the stigma. You know, when I learned about the word, I learned about the stigma that was uh, attached to it. So I never really came out and said I'm an atheist. I just avoided the, the conversation. Um, as much as possible. And then I would say it was in my mid-twenties when I you know, came out 
um, decided it was important to stand up for yeah, exactly. these beliefs. Um, because too, I, I, I saw what was going what was going on, especially um, under Bush with the um, family values. Ah. That's when I started really looking at things. Whose family values are you talking about? And how come that religious right. discussion is creeping into our political discussion? Right. Yeah. And because they were never clear about these family values, it just said family values. And then, but if you look deeper, it was it was Christian family values, mm -hmm. and it was an, a, an attempt to put Christianity into the government, into everyday everybody's everyday life, uh, in one form or another. Um, I was in elementary school. Eisenhower decided. <clears throat> to go ahead and cave in and allow under God to be added to the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. And so I was in elementary school and they said, okay, and now here's your new Pledge of Allegiance. And, and I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not going to say a, that. <laughs> there's a little bit of history Americans don't seem to, either they refuse to accept it or they just don't know it. Right. Um, there is this assumption that it's always been that way. Yeah, I've gotten into several discussions with people saying, you know, the founding fathers said, you know, one nation under God. Well, no, they didn't actually. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of them said, "This is not a Christian nation." Um, and one of them, actually, that was written into law in a treaty, um, that on no circumstances is this a Christian nation. Um, but the it's the it's the fundamentals that fundamentalists that try to distort history to suit their needs um, and to push their agenda. Um, and Fundamentalism is an impulse that we see around the world that I think gets governments, uh, you know, the tensions between the fundamentalist mindset, which says that we want to have power over government to implement our values. Right. Um, we see that rising up around the world that's causing a lot of difficulty. It happens here, it happens in the Middle East, it happens all over. Um, exactly. That fundamentalist strain, I think, is very difficult for secular societies to deal with. Exactly. And because of what was going on, especially with the whole family values campaign, um, it was, I would, you know, meet somebody and they would bring up something about religion or God or whatnot. And I'd say, well, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist. And the typical response was, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you sorry? <laughs> and, they would take pity on yeah, you. Yeah, and that, that actually angered me. I'll bet. Um, and there was a, other events in my life that, you know, that I went through that just caused me to be more outspoken. Um, you know, I'm not the smartest guy on the block. I haven't read the entire Bible. I can't get, I can't get through Genesis. Um, I'm not wanting to tear my hair out of what's left. Um, and that's when I decided um, to write my story. Um, How did this come about then? You're going to do this as, you're writing this screenplay do you have a plan to have it produced? Tell us a little bit about how this works into the screenplay issue. Um, well, ultimately, yeah, I would, I would love for it to be produced. Um, the problem is there's so many rules in Hollywood, it's hard to get noticed. Um, although Hollywood probably would not touch this particular subject matter. I think maybe, yeah, you, unless Bill Maher is going to fund you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been avidly looking for um, independent uh, directors. Um, you might have to go the Kickstarter route. Yeah, that, I was thinking about that. Yeah. A few people have um, directed me towards Kickstarter. Um, Tell us a little bit about the screenplay itself, about the plot. It's you know, there's a lot of me, obviously, in in, in the story. Um, my main character is a uh, multi-ethnic. Um, I don't use the word race because there's no such thing as different human races. Um, True. Uh, another religiously inspired fallacy. Um, um, female uh, atheist and basically her story starts um, at the age of seven when her parents are murdered and she's thrown into the foster care system which Ooh, is interesting. kind of related to me I was adopted um, I didn't go through the foster care system um, but I know many I grew up with many people who did and there's a lot of our foster care system is a disaster oh it is absolutely and so I just, you know, I describe incidents that I've heard of from friends of mine that have gone through the same 
some of the things. These are true things that happened and you shaped them right, and turned them into the fiction of the screenplay. Correct. Um, yeah, psychological abuse, sexual abuse. Yeah. Um, Physical abuse. Yeah. 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 Um, cover her, teen, her teenage years. Um, the I had to throw in the classic uh, high school pregnancy because that is an issue. Um, personally, I didn't go through that myself, but um, then I go into her college years where she faces um, racism because she she's proud of being multi ethnic Well, you wrote a blog for a while that was called Fear of a Beige Planet, which yeah, I always thought was the greatest <laughs> title in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, that started out as a kind of a joke between me and a friend um, who's also uh, mixed, um, and I kind of expanded on it because it, it, it basically it grew. The the idea grew because, it, from my view, my opinion is is that um, evolution is causing the races. I use quotes. Yeah. The races to mix. Um, yeah, yeah, we are headed to. Yeah. Um, Multi-ethnic, <clears throat> you know, a exactly. multi-ethnic population that's a greater and greater segment of the overall society. Right. And we started out as one, and we were being, you know, we kind of separated. We're being idiots about it, so nature is bringing us back as one. Uh, this so is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Alfred Lawrence about issues of um, sort of being an outsider in some ways. I mean, when you are multi-ethnic and you are an atheist in this culture, um, you grow up as an outsider. Growing up female and atheist, I faced a lot of the same thing. When I was in the, um, I was in a, an urban school for the gifted, right? It was a lot of fun. We didn't raise hands. We got to do Robert Frost poetry in the second grade and take French and do all these wonderful things. And then my parents moved to the country. And all of a sudden it was like, oh joy, here I am in the fourth grade and they start every morning with a little prayer over the public address system. And I said, wait a minute, there was that Supreme Court thing, Madeline Murray O'Hare, remember her? That kind of, and they said, we don't care. <laughs> you know, too bad. This is the country. We get to do whatever we want to. And you do find out pretty quickly that there's that sort of prevailing view out there that you are a, you are a deviant from the norm if you don't Correct. fall into those categories. So this is what your protagonist is facing. Correct. I, yeah, I tried to implement that as much as possible in, in her character. Um, her, she, she starts out where she, she's actually she's kidnapped in um, Iraq. Um, I used Iraq at the time because that was the hot spot. Um, and she works for a humanist aid organization, which according to some people just doesn't exist, but there are uh, non-religious aid groups out there. Yeah, there are. Yeah. Um, they just don't get the publicity, obviously. Um, she's kidnapped and then um, by terrorists. So the story is, so I'm not bashing religion. One of the families that takes her in is Catholic and they're very good to her. Um, they were kind of the, the saving grace for her. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> again, yeah. it's hard to avoid the religious terminology. Yeah. It's everything is a giant pun. It's either that or baseball. <laughs> it's really crept into our language. Well, I, I like, I like, I did throw in a lot of irony in there. Um, a lot of the music that inspired me to write it was what you call either religious or spiritual music. Um, Lorena, I don't know if you ever heard of Lorena McKinnon. No. She's a Celtic artist out of um, Canada. Um, her music is absolutely amazing. When I was you know, in the midst of a writer's block, I have her music on, and I remember one song in particular, um, the scene was just, I couldn't get it. It took me six months to come up with a, a two-page scene, but this song just opened it up for me. Um, I even, She even knows, I, I just on a whim, oh, good. Yeah, I wrote her a letter saying, thank you, I, I appreciate your music, and it helped me write, and she responded. And, have you found yourself doing, I mean, atheism went through a spurt of interest with Christopher Hitchens writing about the topic and Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, and I've read my way through those books. I think there is a recent criticism coming out that that is a sort of male-dominated paradigm right now, and that sometimes it's cast as a sort of competitive masculine battle between the believers and the non-believers. I, um, I can see that because of what Fox News does. Um, but actually, I know more female atheists. Than yeah. I do more. Yeah. A lot more. Um, 
So yeah, so I really don't know that that's a. It's an interesting topic because Sam Harris has come out recently and said that um, he has moved off some of that belligerent language about how we have to sort of battle back against religion and argues that what we really need to see is an evolution of religion into a more spiritual approach. Now, there are still uh, atheists out there who are really opposed to the idea that there could be a spiritual side. They view that as being as flawed, a way of dealing with the world that we must be clear-eyed rationalists only. But I think that there is something, there's a longing in human beings for some kind of recognition of a spiritual side and an emotional side that perhaps uh, doesn't have to be particularly religious. So I'm wondering if there's been a sort of softening of the lines here. How would atheists look at the American Indian religion? Well, that's a really good question. Spirituality. My yeah. hunch is they'd be quicker to respect that than they would be some of the current varieties, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. I think so. Oh, yeah. I mean, I... I have studied a little bit on Native Americans, and I don't, I mean, yeah, it's considered spiritual. I think it's more natural, mm-hmm. their, their beliefs. Um, I mean, there were some tribes that had uh, quote-unquote gods, but um, they were more of a, a natural, naturalist. What tradition did your family come up with? How did you become Catholic? French. Ah, it was the French. Oh, I see, I see. Ooh. Canada. Hmm. That side of the family, not the American Indian. Well, there's an interesting... My interest- grandmother was, never practiced any religion you know, with the Indian side. I never saw her go to, ever go to church or ever say anything about a God. She was very quiet about it. One of my grandmothers was an avowed uh, atheist and would have been part of the communist revolution if the family hadn't fled before they got there. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one spent 36 hours in labor and said that cost her her religion right away so she, <laughs> she never went back Practical to church woman, yeah. <laughs> can't be any god no that wouldn't be right they wouldn't do that to people but you know that i was just thinking when you were talking now about religion was the defined reason that uh, american indians had so much trouble in this country true yeah. they were 350 they years ago they, they trying they to convert them if they didn't convert they were savages and yeah. taken care of as savages um and it, and it, it happened in Africa, still going on in Africa. Um, people don't want to acknowledge it, but there's still witch burnings going on in Africa. I know. Oh God, that's right. Um, in fact, there was there was something just recent about that I, I had seen, um, where they're accusing children of being witches. Right. And either stoning them in the streets, mm. or um, or burning them alive. One of the um, just sort of semantic ways that I thought was interesting about approaching it is that we've always heard about the distinction, well, are you an atheist or are you an agnostic? Do you question the existence of God or are you positive? There's a third term that I ran into when I was in my 20s, which is called ignostic, I-G-N-O-S-T-I-C. It's not used very often. But the definition of that is, I don't know whether I agree with your God or not because I have, until you tell me what your definition of your God is. Because God is such an elusive entity in this culture. It can range all the way from the Unitarians, where I think, uh, to be honest about it, I mean, God is sort of optional. You know, you, atheists can go to Unitarian churches and not feel particularly right. uncomfortable. On the other end, there are sort of hyper-religious religious organizations where you'd be drummed out if you were not. Well, I, I've, I've heard the term agnostic atheist, and I, I was just asking somebody about that the other day. Hmm. Like, what is that? I hadn't heard that. Yeah, I'm like, what does that mean? What is an agnostic atheist? That makes no sense um, to me. Um, but e- even on the Dawkins scale, yeah. I'm sure you've heard of it. Yeah. I, I, I put myself at a six. Okay. Um, Dawkins puts himself at a six. And I don't think there's really anyone that can put himself at a seven. Um, because as an atheist, as someone who uses critical thinking, we'll leave open the possibility. There is that possibility. You can't get around that. Um, there's plenty of people put themselves at one. You know, right. Right. Hardcore believers. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, there's probably, I mean, yeah, there's probably a few that put themselves at seven, but I think they're just fooling themselves um, because they're not. One of the most am- amusing days I had was on six six oh six. <laughs> there was a get-together down in Hell, Michigan, and I had my new video cameras. That's where I produced my first YouTube. I've done 800 since then. I'm now up at 801, right? So I go down to Hell, Michigan for the 6606 celebration, you know, Day of Satan. 
And what we had on one side were fundamentalist preachers preaching on one side of the street, <laughs> and the Michigan atheists and humanists on the other side of the street. And it was one of the most amusing days I've ever seen because they were really just going at each other. Probably a mix of bikers also. You did. You had a lot of bikers, yeah, in the in between. What's great, uh, Hell Michigan now has a, um, CFI has got a, uh, skeptics in the pub there. Oh, do they? Yeah. Oh, that's they started, cute. I believe uh, last year. Where, if people are interested, um, where can they find out more about Center for Inquiry? It's quite active here in the state. Yes, yeah, very active here in the state. Um, they're headquartered in, in Grand Rapids, ironically enough. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Seems normal. normal. <laughs> <laughs> anything would chase you away from religion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing our signal doesn't yeah. go too far. I mean, it's, when, it's that <laughs> when it's that intense in your face all the time, something yeah. bad um, can go wrong. Yeah. Um, there's a chapter at Michigan State. There's oh, there's a free thinkers chapter there too, isn't there? I believe that, yeah. yeah. yeah there's, and I believe they meet together sometimes ah, on, okay. on campus. Um, the MSU Skeptics in the Pub, though, is um, here in Lansing. Um, they, uh, their U of M, I believe, has a, campus, uh, has a chapter also. Um, they get some good speakers in. Yes, they they uh, they do. Actually, I got to meet uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, oh wow! Um, last year and a half ago, it was that big lawsuit. Yeah. Um, when the uh, country club canceled because the owner of the club saw the uh, Bill O'Reilly interview. Oh, interesting. And he said that he didn't want to be associated with those kind of people. <laughs> and uh, I'm not really sure where the the suit stands right now, but. Um, uh, there was a hotel in Royal Oak that, yeah, we'll take the business. Um, yeah, yeah. So, though it, it it happened on the weekend, it was supposed to happen. Luckily, but how do we get your film made? Um, well, hopefully, I can find me a. I was actually considering coming to either LCC or MSU and um, get some of the students and get a camera and maybe shoot some scenes and submit it to the uh, to some of the festivals uh. as a short. Um, We've had Michael McCallum on the show, and he's been a very successful independent filmmaker around town, does it all on his own, and it's really amazing. I mean, there are opportunities. The barriers to entry used to be just absolutely astronomical because right. of the cost of the gear, but now it's affordable. So Right. Um, I just need to meet a few more. I, I want somebody who knows the business to you know stop and take a look at my screenplay, because there's still some touch-ups that need to be done. I'd say Michael would be... Get in touch with him through Facebook. Well, he he wants to do his own work, though. I mean, I'm not sure he's interested in shooting it, but he'd know oh, no, people no, advice. Would. I think he'd give yeah, people he'd be, advice. He'd be very he good came at up it. the hard way. Yes, he did. It's a yeah. tough sell a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of it actually takes place here in East Lansing. I mean, oh. yeah, I have, well, they always say, write what you know. Right. So her college years are at Michigan State. Well, maybe we'll have some listeners out there who are budding filmmakers or who are interested in helping in some way, and they can always get in touch with us through Lansing Online News, and maybe we can make some connections. And if not, they can always find you on Facebook, or Alfred Twitter. Lawrence, or Twitter, and you are Darth Beige there. Yeah, Darth Is that... Beige. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the name. That's, clever. That's very clever. So <laughs> I'm eager to hope, and maybe in a year or so, we'll be doing a premiere of your upcoming <laughs> film. We're going to segue now into a little bit of, I hate to say this, but apocalyptic end of the world <laughs> sorts of discussions, really. I mean, when we're talking about nuclear waste, that's not a light topic. And so I'm going to ask Mary Olson, you've come into town to try to tell us what about the issue of, of, of nuclear waste? I have definitely come into town to talk about it because there's two huge watershed moments going on. And actually, as I hear you say that word apocalypse, there's three watershed moments going on, and they're all coming together. And Michigan has quite a lot of this stuff in the state. There are uh, two reactors right in the New Buffalo area. Yes. Cook, Cook, DC Cook, one and two. Palisades is just up the coast in South Haven. Fair There's me. a closed reactor up at the Traverse Bay Charlevoix area, area called Big Rock Point, and fuel is still sitting on that site. And then Fermi with its breeder reactor, first time ever commercial thing that burned. We still don't know what really happened. No, there. we don't. There's the book. We almost and lost Detroit. Yeah, they talk about the progression of events, but the actual question of the radiation, that's why we care about this stuff. And you know, the younger folks who didn't go through the Cold War, didn't go through their parents seeing cities in Japan vaporized right. by atomic bombs. 
didn't see fallout, didn't live with the whole issue of was the rain radioactive through the 60s, you know. So they don't even know that radiation causes cancer. They think that radiation is only a uh, treatment. They don't right. know that it causes cancer. They don't know that it causes birth defects, that it cuts down on fertility, that miscarriages and things like that can spontaneously happen if the mother is exposed. Um, that there's, at higher doses, things like heart disease associated with it. Um, and so, one of the arguments that they to... make, though, is that we also see higher death rates, uh, incidents of death from things like coal-fired plants because of the mercury that they spew out. So all the mercury and the radioactivity. There's yes. a lot of uranium yeah. in coal. Yeah, there is. So it's all dirty energy when it comes to it the is, extractive it? stuff, whether it's oil, whether it's coal, whether it's gas, whether it is uranium being split. And that's what we call nuclear energy is, is uranium being split. And I'm just wanting to make one big point before we move into what are these watersheds, is that splitting uranium magnifies radioactivity far beyond what's naturally occurring. Right. Millions and millions of times more radioactivity after the fuel has been used in a reactor than the fuel that goes in. So the fuel that goes in is making people sick when they dig it up in Indian country and process it in six steps and all that causes yes. a lot of illness, a lot of contamination. You can't see it, so it doesn't look dirty, but believe me, it is dirty. So here it is in, in Michigan. We've got a lot of dirty energy. We've got coal, we've got fracking concerns, we've got oil, and... Uh, I yet. have to tell you that I was actually um, in the cooling tower of Fermi as it was being built. I was part of a group that was given a tour, a group of Kellogg Young Farmers. I was along as a journalist covering it, and I stood in the bottom of that whole giant uh, cooling tower before, obviously, it was active, and looked up at the top of it, and one of the vice presidents of Detroit Energy, uh, which was then called Detroit something else, came over to me and said, would you like to see the secret control room if the terrorists take over the real one? And I said, no. <laughs> Because I don't want to know where it is. <laughs> I mean, I was a little to the left of Abby Hoffman. And I figured if anybody ever did get their hands on that, they'd come for me. But he was, I mean, to show you how casual some of the people are who deal with this, why would you take a person who's standing there and say, you want to see the secret control room? I mean, if that's the way the companies are handling these kinds of materials, I didn't feel particularly comfortable. No, I wouldn't either. But how did it feel standing in the bottom of that huge funnel-shaped thing. Do you remember how it felt? I have always been highly suspicious of corporate power uh -huh. and large edifices that they build. And I thought, here we are in Rome, and how will it, what will the fall look like here? Because I think we were, it extends beyond human reach. It S extends beyond what I think humans can control. So we know what it looks like. Then. Yes, we do. And it's well, happening in Japan right now. Anyone that's it up, is. I remember the first time I saw it, nuclear missiles being trans transported uh. in Probably it was Colorado I was at the time. White train, you mean? The big military, they are moving the missiles in in 69 or 70. It was past, it was past Did Colorado. Did you see them on trucks? Or trucks, on yeah. Trucks. I, was, okay. I got a hitchhike with a guy, the, nu the nuclear engineer that was there to install them. It was pretty sort of like one of those, when you say watershed, that was one of those watershed moments. This I, guy was, he was beside himself when he had to do this, but when you see him. Oh yeah, I worked with a man who wow. was on the plane when a monsoon was coming and they had 14 missiles that they had to get off the island of Guam. And uh, they took them three tries to get the plane into the air. And they were just rattling around in the back of the plane. And he said, I mean, he never flew again. He wouldn't fly again. I mean, that's how traumatizing it is for people to be near this kind of technology, I think. Yeah, psychologically. Psychologically. I think it's yet, very hard to handle. They started turning on nuclear power plants in the 1950s, late 1950s. They built over 120 in the United States. And they never for one moment in that entire time, have had a real plan right. for what was going to be done with the radioactive waste. And they tried to shove it down the throats of the people of Nevada and the Western Shoshone Nation at a place called Yucca Mountain. Yep. It turned out to be technically a complete failure. And in terms of democracy, it was a complete failure. And it hasn't happened, and I don't believe that it will happen, mm -hmm. although we're still having to fight about it. Um, but the failure of Yucca Mountain caused a lawsuit. And the lawsuit was against the regulator that licenses the nuclear power plants, the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And about a year ago, a judge handed down a decision 
that not only said you're right, they never looked at what to do with it or the environmental impacts of storing it with nothing to do with it, but we're taking away your authority to license anymore. So for the last year, the federal regulator has been very quietly trying to patch this up and do an environmental impact statement. And there's going to be meetings coming in October on that attempt to patch it up. But right now, they cannot license a new reactor. The court took that authority away. And that's why I'm saying this is huge. This is once in an atomic age. When I look at something like Fukushima, and it reminds us of the disaster that could be coming, what we've learned from that incident is that you have these fuel rods sitting in what were always supposed to be temporary pounds of water. Right. They were never meant to be permanent. But that's where that waste is being stored now About on 40 site. times more than ever planned is in some of those pools. What is the more. state of the ponds in Michigan? Bad. They're not in containment. The boiling water reactors actually are above ground with the top of the pool five stories up. That's what's at Fukushima. The ones that are not the boiling water reactors uh, are down into the ground, uh, making them in some ways more vulnerable to seismic events. And none of them are in that kind of concrete dome that you kind of think might help you out if you had it. Yeah. And none of the fuel pools are in there. And yet this enormous backlog of radioactivity that's never been moved off these sites. There's a few places where a little bit has been moved amongst uh, reactors owned by the same utility. Uh, the Three Mile Island fuel that did melt, they, they did figure out after the fact that that was a meltdown in Harrisburg. That fuel got moved to Idaho. You know, there's been some move, but it's like the Little League compared to the World Series. And why I'm referring to the World Series is because right parallel to these meetings that I mentioned, where the public's going to get to comment on whether we should make more radioactive waste or not, first time ever, that's the question. Mm. Congress is thinking about trying to just, like, fix it. And Congress's version of fixing it is put up a parking lot, put a chain link fence around it, put a few floodlights on, hire a few guards, and that is your centralized interim storage site. And just say, stay away. <laughs> Not even. They've got cars going down the oh, road no. oh. right within sight of this kind of facilities oh. at the reactor sites, which is why we've started calling for hardening of the storage on site. Take it out of the pool, put it into dry storage, but spread that storage out and put some earth berms around it. Uh, you know create a, a little more security. But the reactor sites are not the final destination. They, you can't leave it at Big Rock Point. You can't leave it at Palisades. But you shouldn't make it into a shell game. We should find a final destination and move it once is where we're at. This whole idea of moving it just so they can make more, that no, doesn't, no, that doesn't, doesn't make stand. sense. When you look at what's happening with TEPCO, the private corporation that owns the Fukushima plant, they're facing having, now that the land underneath many of these uh, reactors is liquefying because of the water that they've been putting on them, and the buildings are starting to, you know, the ground under them is starting to collapse, the plume of water is going out into the ocean, they're facing having to move under extraordinary conditions 15,000 radioactive rods and do each one perfectly because if anyone is dropped, anyone falls apart, then you have a critical incident that could be devastating. Now, we're stuck with that kind of a solution, which just seems to me to be extraordinary. I mean, I don't know. The workers are going to have to be transferred in and out so quickly because of the high rates of radiation there. Over 40,000 people have been working oh. over the past two years at the Fukushima site. A lot of people don't know the details because it's hardly covered in our news. Never. Because this place is less than 100 miles north of Tokyo. The currents are very clearly carrying radioactivity from the Pacific Ocean that's being dumped into it daily. Uh, 400 tons of water yeah. is flowing through and out of the Fukushima site into the Pacific. The debris the is already hitting our country, so we know it's coming to us. Directly to California, Oregon, Washington State, and up into Canada. And it's, it's a total planetary level yes. crisis. Yes. It is not a local issue. And I think it is somewhat reassuring that the Japanese government is finally saying they do need to get involved openly, take over management of this crisis. But my friends who are there tell me that no one agency has yet decided that it's their purview. 
and all of the funding is for next fiscal year. So oh. nobody's treating this as the level of emergency that it truly is. This is a planetary emergency. It I is. mean, we literally could be looking at a, a literally a life extinction event if things escalated out of control. Now, you have to stop and look. When a reactor blew up in the former Soviet Union, everybody dismissed it because it was a Soviet design. The Fukushima <laughs> reactors are general electric GE. design, yes. GE, and they were built by U.S. contractors working with uh, Japanese companies. So, you know, it can happen. We have here. the same design here. We have here. the same, we call them Fukushima clones, yeah. and they're here. Um, they're so, here in Michigan. Palisades. Uh, Palisades, right. Yeah. I want to make that clear. Right. So it's a plant for which I read and proofread some of the nuclear specifications. Yes, back in the old days at Consumers Energy, which was then Consumers Power in Parnell Road. Yeah. Where there's a, it would be hard to find a grimmer, more boring job than to proofread nuclear specifications. Back in the days of the Atomic Energy Commission, so that was the old agency that regulated them. And I think there was a naivete at the time. I mean, I, we were coming out of the. 50s, where when I was a kid, we watched Dave Garraway in the morning on the ra on the TV shows, showing us the uh, the bombs that were being set off and at uh, out, outside of Las Vegas. And I remember seeing the American soldiers and just in battle fatigues, a mile away, and they kept saying, "Well, they're safe right where they are. They just have to wear sunglasses." And they would detonate this bomb. And I mean, we were very naive about radiation radioactivity for many many years. Radiation hurts everyone. There is no safe dose. This is every federal agency of the United States and worldwide acknowledges there is no level of radiation that has zero risk. If you want zero risk, you have to have zero additional exposure over natural background. But, and even natural background is causing natural cancer. Right. But um, little known, and I want to bring out, is the fact that there are many differences in our population. Elder people have less ability to repair. Radiation impacts our cells, and the repair mechanisms in our cells are part of what keep us from everybody getting cancer all the time. As we get older, those uh, mechanisms are less able to function. But there are also long time known that children are more vulnerable because their cells are dividing more rapidly. The DNA is more vulnerable. But it turns out that in the zero to five age group, little girls are twice as likely to get cancer as little boys. And we really don't know what that is because in that age group, zero to five, there aren't a lot of lifestyle differences. No. There aren't a lot of occupational exposure issues. There's not they didn't take up smoking. No. A lot of dietary, you know. I mean, little boys and little girls are kind of in the same group between zero and five. And yet, little girls are at twice the risk of, of at some point in their lifetime, getting cancer if they're exposed to radiation at that time. And across the lifetime, it's still a 50% higher so adult women are 50% more likely to get cancer from a CAT scan or an airplane ride or Palisades or Fermi yeah. than men in the same exposure levels. So we don't really know why yet. Hopefully the next generation of uh, good scientists and policy people are going to take this seriously because if we believe in equal protection, this is not <laughs> yet it's equal protection. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to come out for the, I made this joke earlier today, I don't want to come out for the femrem, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the, even the units of radiation are based on the period that you're talking about with those soldiers and right. with the guys who made the bombs in the first place, that yeah. whole large numbers of young adult males, it was called the standard man that they generated to be able to create the radiation standards. Right, they, it was. They did it for the standard man. Well, they were going into radiation areas. That so was a very uh, rare and unusual thing for radioactivity to be around back in the 30s and the 40s. But now it's all over the place, and they're generalizing those standards for those young men to you and me yeah. and our little baby girls and our grandbaby girls. But don't you understand? All we have to do is put it at the bottom of Lake Huron, and we'll all be safe. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, brilliant person came up with that idea, and where is, is that going anywhere? You know, I have a handout that I can commend to everybody from um, the folks at Nuclear Free Great Lakes, 
And I really suggest that people look into this Canadian plan to construct a underground, almost under the edge of the water, possibly under the water uh, place to put uh, medium, intermediate and so-called low level waste. Uh, it does not sound like a good idea to me, but I have to admit that I'm not working specifically on that issue. So I'm going to just say that the Nuclear Free Great Lakes folks are on it. There are hearings happening. Maybe there you want to say one, something about this? There was one in Detroit. Is there? Yeah, there was one in Detroit yesterday. Oh, uh, Linda Lewison, uh, Sierra Club, are we... Uh... Ottawa is holding hearings in September. There are people giving uh, testimony about this deep underground dump, as we call it, from both America, from both the United States and Canada over a series of a couple weeks, uh, written testimony, oral testimony, uh, before this goes any further. Um, and I and people from Don't Waste Michigan and many other um, organizations here in, this, in the Great Lakes area, I don't know if people are aware that there are 35 reactors around the Great Lakes. And the largest of these is at Bruce, although I'm not sure if we count that as a Great Lakes, but there are eight reactors at Bruce, which is the peninsula, you know, across. But that's where this, that's what they want to do, is get rid of all of that radioactive waste. Well, you know, I think people also forget that we drink that water. No. Yeah. And, and yeah. I can't, I'd like to know how many people drink. And eat the fish that great, come great, Drink Great Lakes water. It's got to be immense. Well, and that's our, I mean, that is the thing that will save us. You know, I mean, when we're looking at all of the challenges of what's coming with the climate. And I think, I know I know two people that talked about how one of the reasons they moved to Michigan from Arizona was simply because in the future we'll have some water and Arizona isn't going to. I mean, these are precious resources here. What are we looking at with Michigan's plants? What would make sense in terms of trying to deal with that waste? Where would be a logical place to take it for that one time, one move? Well, actually, you have to start today. You can't talk about that one time, one move, because if it gets out now, here, you can't move it. Oh. Right? So the issue of isolation and containment starts today. It should have started, like, when the reactor was turned on, but it didn't. Right. So we have these overfull, liquid-cooled situation, you know, fuel pools is what they're called. And they are densely packed. They've been re-racked and re-racked so that they have literally 40 times more uh, material than they were designed for. And nobody ever thought that the waste was going to stay in there more than five years. And yet at most sites, there has been waste generated and is still in there from day one. So the first step is to take that fuel out of those pools and put it into dry containers. There are dry containers at Fukushima that were loaded before they were already there before the earthquake and the tsunami. They went through the quake. They went through the tsunami. They did not blow up, which the reactors did. They did not burn, which two of the fuel pools did. They, we don't really know if there's some radiation leaking out, but it's certainly not the big issue over there. So every single reactor site in the United States needs to start reducing the amount of fuel in the pools. You have to cool in liquid for the first five to ten years, depending on the type of, of fuel that's in use. But there is 40-year-old fuel at some of these sites ah. that is still in the pool. And so taking that backlog and putting it into dry storage on the site and ensuring that the way in which that dry storage is done is secure. Because right now they're just lining those containers up on a pad like a parking lot. They look like bowling pins. And it's really not a good situation if you have... Um, uh, any type of disruption, whether it's a malicious act or tornadoes or whatever. So we call it hardened on site. And then why would we want to continue making this material that honestly we still do not know what we are going to do with it? We have other ways to generate electric power. Nationally, it's only about 20% of the total. Um, yes, we have to be turning off coal plants. No, we do not want to be fracking. But honestly, between good design and efficiency, reducing the amount that people are pulling into their products, into their services, into their homes, so efficiency plus wind energy plus solar energy plus appropriate hydro plus geothermal, we can do it. It's called carbon-free, nuclear-free, and it is our future. So the sooner we get there, the better. 
Now, okay, we've got the waste out of the pools, we've got the reactor shut down, we've got everything sitting in a more secure constellation called hardened storage on site, and yes, we do need a place to take it. And do we have an honest scientific inquiry going on about where that might be since Yucca Mountain was such a failure? That site was salty, it has it water, did, yeah. water, it was going to corrode the It was on a fault line that they had well, not, yeah. 200 earthquakes had happened. Uh, the people there were... I need to throw in, this is LCC Radio, WLMZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. We're talking with Mary Olson, and we're now zeroing in on the question of not in my backyard. That's where we're not going to put it. <laughs> you may talk democracy, but, you know, if you're talking about... It depends on who gets to vote. If it's my backyard, I'm going to do thumbs down. If it's 300 million of us, I might say, guess what, Mary? Get that backyard ready, because that's where I'm going to put it. So this is the hard challenge. I want to give a, a shout-out to Sierra Club and let Linda talk about the priorities around these coming meetings. I will say that when I have my back pushed to the wall about where should we put this waste... What I love to say is take the people and the desks out of the Pentagon mm. and put the waste in there for temporary storage. That'd and be nice. People like granite, and so that granite right there inside the Beltway, those are the people who said we should do this. Those are the people who continued to approve it. They should be the ones to oversee this perfect isolation. That's my bottom line. I'd go for that in a heartbeat. I think the chances are hmm, a little dim, however, given our current political climate, where do we think it will go? Or will it just continue to sit where it is? Um, it should not sit where it is more than decades. You yeah. know, there's t discussion of could it be centuries? No, it could not be centuries where it is. Um, but it may take a few decades. I will fight to my own grave to keep it off of native lands, which has been That's, the predominant I wondered about that. That's, model I keep is, hearing that model. Is send it to the red people. <sighs> And I will, will personally stand up because I don't think that that's morally correct. I think that they have sovereignty. If they want to build a waste site, fine. But our dominant culture and our government should not permit the export of our worst waste, our very worst waste, to a small sovereign nation like that. If it was Haiti, people would be up at arms that we were putting it all on boats and sending it there. And we should be equally up at arms about sending it to Shoshone, to Mescalero, to Skull Valley Go Shoots, any of them. One of the things that worries me is that I think when I look back to the previous anti-nuclear uh, demonstrations, which succeeded in bringing the construction of new plants to a halt in this country, literally, um, I worry that the changes that I've seen in policing and the changes that I've seen in laws and RICO laws and the kinds of prosecutions that are taking place now when people hold any kind of protest. We just had some Keystone protests in the state and people are facing horrific felony charges for what seemed to me to just be uh, their civic right to protest. Um, I'm worried that we would have a hard time closing down the idea of, I mean, even new nuclear plants now. Oh, you, bu 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 bu. <laughs> we, we've had this year, in, just in spring, Crystal River is closed, Kiwani is closed, San Onofre 2 and 3 have closed. That's four operating reactors have come down of their own weight, really. Right, but they want to build new ones. And of the 30 that have been proposed, there are four that have won licenses, but they're running into total delays and cost overruns. And of the 30, four are on track and 10 remain under review and the rest have all been canceled and scrubbed. And they're coming down by the day. We just had a big So surprise. you don't think that there's any danger that we're going to see a new one built? I think that we have a future. The definition of a positive future is that it is sustainable, mm -hmm. right? That's what sustainability is. It's something that will go forward. It, it can be supported. It is viable, and nuclear is not viable. It's re really a Ponzi scheme for the mega corporations to take money from their customers ahead of the schedule in the southeast called construction work in progress and pad their little pockets with it, and they may or may not ever build the reactors. They took over a billion dollars out of consumers in Florida, and now they have canceled the reactors, and we're celebrating um. because... We don't want those reactors to contaminate that beautiful spring water in the nature coast of Florida. And yet we are very sad because over a billion dollars has been sucked out of people who will get absolutely nothing for it. Right. Nothing. And that's money that could have been invested in clean energy alternatives. Yeah, call that sustainable. It's not sustainable. Yeah. 
And we have a finite supply of uranium, and it would be used up very rapidly with the plans that were on the boards. And so this is what we're facing with almost all of our fuel sources right now, is that we do need to be looking at renewables. You, I agree with what you just said, but it's also the battle cry for why they want to go to plutonium. Well, that's and true. And plutonium economy was looked at by Margaret Mead, the Margaret Mead, and her husband, Gregory Bateson, and they did a beautiful report for the National Council of Churches going into all the reasons back in the 70s that a plutonium economy would be a disaster, not the least of which is thermonuclear war that comes when the wrong people, including our own military, get their hands on plutonium. And so, you know, it's, it's one bad idea after another, and it's really, I think, kind of wearing people out to try and figure out how to make it sound good. Right. And I've got a quick question. With all social movements, there, there's, at some point, appears a leader uh, that, mm -hmm. that's articulate and charismatic. Is there someone in the anti-nuclear movement nationwide that is filling that role, besides yourself? Mm -hmm. I mean, that so people will begin to recognize that name? There are incredible heroes, but at the moment, I think that the youth activists are not going for that kind of star power. And it's a much more egalitarian, horizontal um, kind of organizing that's happening. I've seen that. Well, we saw that with the Occupy movement. But does it work? You know, though, that the national gathering is occurring in Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo. this yeah. week, yeah. which is, uh, yes, the national Occupy gathering is uh, starts Wednesday in Kalamazoo. Yeah. I mean, Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates has done the, the best and the strongest independent work on Fukushima. Um, Bob Alvarez is doing the big analysis on what are the challenges with the fuel, how much is at each site. Jeff Fettis is the one who argued the case that got the judge to strike down the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's ability to do the licensing. His colleague Diane Curran is another attorney who is just doing amazing work. Harry Lodge is in Toledo and is helping with the Fermi fight. Um, but these are not you know, star power kind of people. Bonnie Maybe Raitt and Jackson Ryan. Brown are still yeah. out there giving the battle cry. Um, what is the role of the Sierra Club in this? The, the Sierra Club has uh, coal free campaigns and uh, gas, yeah, concerned about uh, natural gas. And we are just meeting last weekend in Chicago, a summit, a core team of the Sierra Club from all over the country developing a nuclear free campaign to gear up to address uh, all the issues that Mary just discussed and specifically this moment in time to galvanize Sierra Club members support for these meetings specifically in Chicago and it's amazing that Chicago isn't on the list of these meetings because we have more radioactive waste from reactors than any other state but the meetings in the Midwest are in Minneapolis and Toledo. So we're trying to get busloads of people together to come to these meetings and ensure that uh, this lack of confidence that there isn't a future in uh, what to do with the radioactive waste until we figure it out in a more sensible way uh, continue. So that that's what the Sierra Club is hoping to support right now. Mary, you're having an event tomorrow with the Peace Education Center? Yes, we're doing a briefing and a potluck, and we're going to be talking about whether they want to sponsor a bus to Toledo. Uh -huh. We don't yet have the date. Uh, that word will have to come out through the grapevine because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission hasn't said it, but it will be in the second half of October. It'll be a weeknight. And a bus would be a lot better because the meeting will probably end between 9.30 and 10. And who wants to drive home at that hour? Plus, it's fun on a bus. It is. I like the bus. I'm the world's biggest bus fan. Yeah. yeah. So it's only, you know, an hour and a half to Toledo, something like that. That would be great. So tomorrow night's potluck, where do people go? They go to the Unitarian Universalist Church. And what time would that be? About 6 Six o'clock. Six, six. I'm getting hand signals from Tom Rico in the other room of the Peace Education Center who's giving me some info on exactly what's happening there. So, yes, well, that sounds like an opportunity for people then to meet both of you. Will you both be there? And they can follow up on this conversation and find out a bit more about exactly what's going on in upcoming meetings. And at LansingOnlineNews.com, we'll try to provide some information and put up dates and information about how people can become part of that bus trip going down there.
Can I give my website too? Yes, that'd be great. www.nirs.org. And right on the front page, there's a Stop Mobile Chernobyl, which is about Congress wanting to put this stuff on the roads and the rails. You can sign a petition in a couple clicks and get more information about these meetings as well. Thank you so much. This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. Bonnie and Bill signing off from Lansing Online News Radio. See you next week. I think we got everything in.